<coughs> Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to welcome Ski uh, today. Al has a book out and a hashtag, which is Power of Disability. He, he was the co-founder of Plan Lifetime Advocacy Network. Um, so, Al, welcome to the show. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background, how you came to work in the space, and how Deborah describes you as someone that is separated from her at birth? <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for having me on. And where I am, you got me up earlier than usual, so maybe I'll have a good day. <laughs> um, so, a little bit about my background. I, I I I would consider my profession to be a community organizer, and uh, so worked for years and years and years in uh, uh, communities that were dealing with exclusion or poverty or homelessness. And then um, 40 years ago or so, uh, my second daughter was born. Her name is Liz. And she, uh, as she describes it, um, her disability is rad. Her Down syndrome is rad. And that um, plunged me into a whole new world. And I very, very quickly uh, figured out how to apply whatever skills I had as a community organizer um, into the into the disability world. So uh, I don't know how much further you want me to go, but I spent a lot of time here in Canada closing big institutions, closing segregated schools, um, doing government, um, protesting. Yeah, yeah we want to know things. about that. We, we, <laughs> we want to know about you closing the schools and suing the to, because it you know it's these kind of things that change the society that we live in, right? And yeah. it takes advocates well, and people with passion to drive this through. I mean, this was, uh, I mean, this goes back uh, the early 80s for me, and um, things uh, are a lot different now. They're not anywhere close to what they should be, but they're, they're a whole lot better. But in my home province of British Columbia in Canada, we had three big, institutions and we had segregated schools where all kids with disabilities particularly those with uh, a developmental or intellectual disability were put and if they weren't there they were in segregated classes in schools segregated workshops all of that kind of stuff so um in order to change that we couldn't nudge it we had to become protesters. Uh, and so um, I became the executive director of a pretty middle class organization and we turned ourselves into a, a pretty effective <laughs> activist organization and blocked roads and did all those other things that I mentioned um, and uh, and got all those things closed. But in the, in the big but, um, and maybe this is where it unites me with Deborah, is that um, Old habits die hard, and uh, habits reveal or betray attitudes and beliefs and values about disabled people that don't go away just because people are living in the community now. And that's been a lifelong preoccupation with me, is how do you deal with what I like to call the cultural determinants of change, that they drag anchor on all the advances. And um, that's where we are today. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book. And I think it's what um, compels, you know, Deborah to do what she does and why we instantly recognize each other. I agree, Al. I agree. And I remember when the doctors told us um, that Sarah had Down syndrome, she we weren't told at birth, which is unusual. You're usually told before you give birth or right at birth. And we were not told um, until Sarah was four months old. And so we already, I, we already knew this baby. And when we were told, it was so, it was such a tragedy. And, and then I start looking around for data and, and everything is so dark and gloomy and the predictions for this little baby's life and I just didn't even understand why is her life a tragedy it's not and uh, you and I uh, I was blessed to have you on my show human potential at work and we talked a little bit about this but 
I remember wanting to be a champion for my children, obviously, and certainly for my daughter born with Down syndrome, but I also wanted to give back to the community. This is my community. But I will tell you, I got a chilly reception coming into the field because I was a parent. And I thought, Hmm. well, but what? But but shouldn't I? My goodness, if parents aren't allies, uh, you know, now I turn out to also be an individual with disabilities like most human beings. And turns Mm -hmm. out that my husband is aged into a very, very serious disability. I, I didn't even realize. I remember when my daughter, when they told me she had Down syndrome and um, I blurted out, you know, something very intelligent. Well, I'm not telling my mom just because my mother who is deceased and I love my mother so much, but my mother had borderline personality disorder. And when I did tell my mom, my mom asked me if I took drugs during my pres- my pregnancy, which um, just for anybody that's curious, no, didn't take drugs. And by the way, taking drugs during your pregnancy doesn't cause Down syndrome. We don't know as a society what causes Down syndrome, but I still believe my daughter's life is not a tragedy. I believe your daughter's life is not a tragedy. I believe my life is not a tragedy. So really understanding, and we talk about this on this show and on other shows, about the power, once again, the power of humanity, the power of, you know, being human, as your book is and, you know, talks about the power of disability, because disability is a very normal, very natural part of being a human being and I think we should really embrace being that and I know Neil was the first one I heard say I'm going to come out as an individual with disabilities with invisible disabilities you know using the same terminologies that we see other diversity groups using like the LGBT but why not be really proud of who we are and who our children's are our children are but at the same time Um, we need to embrace all allies. And I'll make one more comment, which is a sort of sad comment, but I, once again, when they told me my daughter had Down syndrome, I didn't think, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't think I'd ever met somebody with a disability. When I did, what I didn't realize that I was surrounded by it. And I also myself have an invisible disability, but I found out later, my great grandmother, she had epilepsy and sadly she had an epileptic fit and she was beside the fireplace. She found the fireplace and burned to death. So I actually have quite an, a, a robust history of family members with disabilities. Now, does that mean something's wrong with my family line? I would absolutely um, say no. I think I have a diverse and beautiful family line. But mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. so tell us more about your book, Al. Well, it, this uh, last point you made around pride, um, is, um, you know, is what I see happening now around the world. Um, and I'm just an observer um, of this among various groups of people who uh, describe themselves as being disabled. And um, in fact, the younger generation doesn't even use the nomenclature person with a disability, which is what was drilled into my head. It's now a disabled person for many people. But there's a pride and a confidence and uh, a consciousness developing. And this consciousness is uh, creating its own language, creating language to describe uh, the experience of being a disabled person in the world, creating uh, images and signals and symbols um, uh, via artists with disabilities. And so there is a I think a blossoming, and we're we're about to enter what one reviewer of my book uh, suggests is the golden age of disability. Um, and it it's it's not that it didn't exist before, uh, i.e. the contributions uh, of people with disabilities throughout history. In fact, I believe that if we wrote the history of the world and eliminated the contributions of people with disabilities, we would not recognize the world. That's how profound the impact has been. Big problem is that uh, all of those contributions are either unrecognized or they've been attributed to other people. And so I wrote the book, you know, to say, hey world, wake up. 
to the authoritative voice and experience of people with disabilities in all aspects of life. In the areas of sexuality, in the areas of democracy and social justice, in the areas of science, in the areas of, of the arts, in the areas of, let's call it existential, in the areas of being human. What is the nature of being human? In all of those areas, if you're looking for advice, check out a source that's been ignored for too long and that contains a treasure, treasure chest of wisdom and experience and advice on every topic imaginable for you as a person, for your organization, or for society. So that's, that's the book. Wow, wow, that's wow, that's such a powerful statement. I, I know that I, a lot of my coworkers and my company have disabilities. Well, over, gosh, 85%, uh, probably a little bit higher than that. And we're very proud of that. And one of my, um, one of my uh, employees, one of my par colleagues um, is Lamandre Pugh, and Lamandre has a physical disability. And I said to him a couple of times, um, and, I meant, and I understood how I meant this. I said, um, I don't even see your disability. I don't see Rosemary's disability. And I meant it very um, authentically in that I see him as a complex human being. I don't just see the disability, but he has done this moment of impact that will be out in a couple of weeks that said, but I don't want you not to see my disability because that's part of who I am. Absolutely. And I love how the young, yeah, the younger generations are, are really owning who they are. And, and, and I would ask a question of Neil, because I know that Neil has a couple of, you know, complex um, disabilities himself. And I'm <clears throat> curious from his perspective, it, and, and he talks often about his walk on the show, but, I, I'm not sure how much he's ever talked about how his parents helped Neil with this walk. And, and I, as you okay. were talking, yeah, I was just curious about that aspect. As we talk about this, I, I just love the topic. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I I think my, my walk was very different in that I, uh, un, I came under diagnosis late in life. Um, so I went through childhood with supportive parents, but it, uh, and innate knowledge that there was something about me that was different, and my, you know, and that runs in the family. And 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 so my mother was a scholarship student and a slow reader. Uh, you know, so, but but in uh, in that period of time, they weren't talking about dyslexia. My my sister was. Uh, you know, on the borderline with dyslexia. So my, you know, it's there and in the background in my family, but uh, because I was reasonably academic and sort of, uh, engaged at school, I, I I just ignored the fact to a certain extent. I felt that I was a bit different, but I, you know, was doing okay. And we associated at that point in time Dyslexia was a real, you know, we, we still had the, the societal model of deficit, and therefore we're only thinking about people with severe intellectual disabilities or severe learning dis, uh, difficulties as being dyslexic and not this whole sort of neurodiversity. Uh, and then again with ADHD, which I've been recently diagnosed, the, you know, the assumption it would be someone twitching in the corner of the classroom, not me as a dilettante, window gazing, romantic kind of person. So uh, they were, you know, absolutely supportive. Um, but I, I would say they didn't really understand the issues because they weren't taught about the issues. So, um, so I think the passion for me, as someone that's not a parent, is actually I still have the same desire that both of you have. Which is that this is the work that I'm doing is for, for society. I have a personal connection with it, and I'm doing it for, for for society because I believe it to be the right thing to do. Because there are lots of people out there that haven't been lucky like me to come from a you know white male middle class privileged background where I had good education, access to learning, and all of the support that I needed to be successful. 
Um, and, and we need we, we need to be mindful that I am coming from that position of privilege where um, you know it, it's made that disability and those or those disabilities less in, you know less impactful. It's not that they haven't had any impact, but but someone from a, a different socioeconomic background of different ethnicity will have had the same level of disability but would have had that magnified through their social circumstance and, and so support of parents support networks of society are really really important uh, and, and it's one of the things that, that motivates me yeah yeah um you know this this whole issue of uh why are we doing this work um has plagued me because um you know, people people put you up on a pedestal, um, and that's first of all, it's wrong. It's it's not appropriate, and, and everybody on a pedestal has clay feet. That that I know for sure throughout history. So I'm I'm wary for that reason. But the other reason I'm wary is that if somebody said to the three of us, "Here is the key." to a, a room that is full of untold treasures. There are riches there that you could never imagine. There are treasures there that will uh, enrich your life and the life of your family and society uh, till the end of time. You'd take the key, wouldn't you? And that's what I feel um, when I look out at the uh, disability world, past, present and, and future is that it's a treasure trove of riches um, that uh, have been ignored and that, you know, the old Ghostbusters line, who are you going to call? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. if, if it, the world's in trouble uh, now, it's going through a rocky period. Who are you going to call? Well, I'm suggesting we pay attention to uh, an underutilized or untapped source, uh, people with disabilities. You got trouble in your organization with motivation, with morale, with getting new ideas on the table because things change so fastly, who are you gonna call? Disabled people. You're uh, struggling personally with marriage, uh, with growing old, with uh, coming to terms with something uh, an illness, uh, you or somebody you love, or et cetera, et cetera, losing a job, who are you going to call? Disabled people. Uh, there's a lot of advice and experience and acumen and uh, untold um, wealth that um, we have ignored for too long. Well said, well said. And I, I, I love the part when you were talking earlier about, and Neil brought this up as well, about sort of the identity and the language. And I, I like you, I have, it has just been drilled in my brain about people first language, people first language, nothing about us without us, which totally still agree with. But, and then I start seeing the younger people with disabilities not saying, no, I don't embrace that language, it's ridiculous, you know? and and. And I and as um, I was talking about that example with Lamandre and Lamandre, he sent me the the this short video he did and he said, Deborah, I'm sending it specifically to you because I know that when you made that comment, I don't see your disability. I know you. He said, I know how you meant it. And so I, I do not want to accidentally insult you and what I'm saying. And and so I watched the video and. I just thought it was so beautifully done. And I came back to him and I said, I want to learn. I always want to learn. And, and I don't know everything. Like you said, we do get put on pedestals. And I'm just, you know, I'm just a mom in Virginia that thinks that my daughter is pretty darn amazing. And I think your daughter's pretty amazing. And I, I just, I think can we make way for more voices? But at the same time, don't throw out the allies that are there to support us. I, I think part of the reasons why the community has gotten annoyed with parents 
is because for a while parents were the only ones with voices at the table. And so I think sometimes in society we flip back and forth, back and forth. And so it is about true identity, but having allies across the board, including people without disabilities. So I, I think some of the things that you've talked about to me, Al, about how some of the um, programs that you're going to be putting on with the music and the arts. Um, and we recently had um, the blind poet Dave Steele on and oh. His poetry is so beautiful and is really, really touching people's lives. But uh, I think that there, there is, there's a renaissance happening. There's something really beautiful in power. And the more we own who we are, like even, I think, Neil, sorry to compliment you, Neil, but I think, Neil, the comments that he made earlier were so beautiful as he, you know, yeah thanked his parents and as he comes out and and really owns who he is and because he wasn't a bad student nobody thought to and I was sort of the same way I wasn't a great student in school um, I was always in trouble for talking I know that's such a big surprise and that you know the teacher would say next person that says one word and I would giggle because I, I would get nervous and I would get in trouble but I really exploring who we are and what it means and bringing the, the community together. And I know you are good friends with um, Dr. Caroline Casey that we love. And, and by the way, we forgot to mention Antonio is coming home from London. So he um, had a delayed flight, so couldn't join us today. But um, well, he's so hidden in the background. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's lurking <laughs> at the back, but his connection's poor. So he's not wanting to disturb. But uh, yeah. I, I, I'd like to interject a little bit before we move on, and I want to hear about the arts stuff that you're doing. But um, I, I think that this whole identity thing and language is is interesting and fraught with difficulty for people around the world. Because if if we look at from my perspective in my role, I work for a multinational company, so I'm working with lots of different countries and different cultures and and the language that's used in different cultures varies too. So we go on to social media and we see young people like Deborah saying in, in the UK and in, in Canada and in, in, in North America saying, yeah, you know what, I'm an autistic person. Um, you know, I'm, I'm autistic, I'm disabled. Um, you know, whereas in France, you know, we still haven't got past handicapped. Uh, in Germany, they're still using that language too, and that's perfectly socially acceptable, uh, even amongst some of my colleagues who have these disabilities. So, understanding where you are, the context of who you're talking to, also affects the way that you, the, the language you use. And sometimes, when you're writing for the the internet. You can't have that context, or yeah. you you don't. So you don't know. You're talking to a, a much wider audience. So so sometimes I think we have to be, as a community, more understanding of the fact that there are all of these nuances, and we can have this kind of middle ground between person first. Because I agree, you know, we do want to address the person and not just see a condition. But you can say, you know, I'm Neil. This is Neil, who is dyslexic. He has ADHD. You know, you're, you're affirming both things. So you're saying, yes, it's part of who I am. It's it's affecting my makeup, but it's not the totality. Um, and, and I think I, I do think that that is something that that varies depending on the conditions. So different groups have different opinions on this. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. And. Um, I, the phrase I, I uh, use to describe this is that it's a disability is both the, the nature of a person's disability is both no big deal and it's the real deal. And so we live in a world where it's either or, where things seem to be polarized. We, we need to be pigeonholed into one thing or the other. And what's being offered to us now, and what a great lesson. You see, I think this, this, um, uh, discussion around terminology is a beautiful example of a, a coming together. It's a unification. It will eventually lead to uh, a deeper understanding. And, and so, um, I mean, just think about it. How, you know, I, I remember 50 
plus years ago <clears throat> when the second phase of the women's movement was in the ascendancy, um, you know, women were essentially saying, we cannot describe our experiences as a woman, as a woman uh, in the context of language that has been developed by, uh, by men in a patriarchal culture. And so we're going to take the language back and we're going to develop our own art and our own culture and our own symbols and images and so that we can describe more fully what it means to be a woman in a man's in a, in a man's world and so what a beautiful thing now uh, to see uh, in the disability world that ascendancy hallelujah and so yeah i, I mean neil your 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 fundamental point is Stop, listen, pay attention to the language that people use, not only from country to country or culture to culture, but even within a culture, there are a range of opinions and, 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 and be as respectful as you possibly can in that regard. Because in doing so, we will learn uh, to listen and I think it will bring us closer together. So uh, that's, that's sort of the way, I, I mean, what a wonderful time to be in when this tumult is happening uh, around language. I think it's a good signal. Well said, well, well said. said. And so what do we do now? I mean, what are the next steps? I know you have, um, I love what you're doing with your book and the way you're telling the story and bringing the communities together. And uh, I know that you're supportive of Dr. Caroline Casey's work as we are also. Mm -hmm. and. And we believe in the power of disability. This is what we've been talking about for five years on Access Chat. So we obviously yeah. believe in it. Yeah. But what's next? How do we help? I mean, we're helping by having you on the show and we'll be tagging power of disability. But um, you would even talk to, um, as, as you explain, you know, answer the question now. Also, I loved what you were doing with your book in supporting um, nonprofits and disability persons organizations around the world that want to to use this data to you know to help with their own cultures. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm my um, look. Uh, it won't be any surprise if anybody's looking at this through the through the video <laughs> that I'm uh, you know I'm I'm uh, older and uh, and so. I'm trying to be useful by uh, shining a light on what's happening out there uh, and trying to open as many doors as I can because of what uh, ever privilege that I have <clears throat> so that uh, the folks who can tell the story <laughs> uh, in their own words do it. And um, so, uh, one of the things I'm doing is is hosting. I, I don't like book launches, so we're 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 hosting Power of Disability celebrations, and I I envisage them as concerts in which um, musicians and singers and spoken word poets and dancers and storytellers uh, from the world of disability come together to present a concert for their town or city. And there are ways to do that. So it's both uh, not a disability event, as we were talking, and of course, a disability event. And so uh, that's one of the things that I hope the book will do. I'm getting a lot of interest in using the book to tackle this thing that we both, the three of us have been talking about, which is how slowly cultural attitudes change. And so you might have a commitment to diversity or you might have a commitment to accessibility, but if you're not welcome, uh, in, if you're not included, uh, then uh, we still have a long way to go. It, it just So accessibility in that sense gets you in the door and then what? And so a lot of people are saying, well, this book uh, or these stories or these concerts or these, um, uh, well, yeah, so, and these uh, are potentially uh, a way of helping employees in a government bureaucracy, uh, in a company or corporation, or in society at large, to 
to recognize what they may not have looked at before, what they may not have paid attention to before. So I don't know if that's answering your question or not, or not Deborah. No, no, that, that, no, that was that was excellent because. It, it, the reality is we have to keep doing it. We have to, those of us that do have privilege, we have to open the door behind us and make sure that other voices are heard, which is what we're all doing. And mm -hmm. I, I know that something that you and I, Al, are very, very concerned about, as well as others, and I know Neil cares about this and Antonio does too, but, you know, the poverty when it comes to the community of people with disabilities. And so I know that's also something that, yeah. You're hoping th these efforts will address, and I know we're talking about ways we can work together, but, you know, that's one reason why we wanted to have you on Access Chat, because we want to know who in the world is making a difference and really trying to make the world work better for everyone, and um, that, I think that's one reason why your work is so powerful. Right. Thank you. Yeah, poverty is, you know, all things, everything else that we talk about, but if you're poor and you're having to break by every day, every second, on top of getting yourself ready for a world in which uh, it's not accessible, then um, you have no time or very little time to be creative and to make your contribution. So, yeah, we, I mean, we created a registered disability savings plan here in Canada and changed all the welfare rules to eliminate the limits on assets that you can have and also to eliminate clawback. And all that did, I mean, it's a good start, uh, and about $4 billion in the collective deposits of registered disability savings plans. But what it did as well was awaken Canadians to the fact that poverty and disabilities go hand in hand. And they shouldn't. And so uh, now a group of disabled people are assembling a grassroots campaign to essentially create a guaranteed basic income for disabled people so that we can eliminate that handicap. Because if you eliminate that one, um, I think we're going to see uh, a resounding uh, um, voice of participation from the world of disabilities. I agree, uh, I agree. Yeah, go ahead. Go on, Deborah. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I'm just, I'll say something real quick and then pass it to you, but I agree and I'm introducing Al to uh, Michael Morris and some leaders from Citibank that have both in the United States been working a lot on these issues too. And so I, I agree, it, it's a huge issue. So go, go ahead, Neil. So just to build upon the points that Al, Al's made, um, it's essentially not only were there um, rules and systems in place that made it really difficult for disabled people to save, but we failed to take into account the, the additional cost of living wow. as a disabled person. So, <laughs> so you've got this double whammy. You've got the fact that just doing your day-to-day -day stuff is likely to cost more because maybe you can't access a website where it's where stuff is cheaper or you've got to pay for care or you've got to go the long way around or you've got cabs or, or all of these things that you need just to be able to participate in life. Then you couple that with the fact that you're uh, often penalized and can't have a certain amount of savings or the benefits that you get to support you are cut. The, the, we need to be taking a holistic view of how we look at finances for disabled people to make sure that we're not unduly penalizing them but doing what we encourage everyone else to do, which is to save. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're, you've, uh, you've been much more precise than I've been, Neil, in describing what um, it's almost mandatory poverty by the welfare system imposed on uh, disabled people. And um, um, my wife and I are going to be doing some work um, in Denmark um, in March, and they want to rethink their whole social welfare system. 
And I think that's that's what we need to be doing. Uh, we we need to eliminate welfare police. We need to look at all the subsidies that are supposed to go to disabled people, but they go to all kinds of other people under the guise of helping people with disabilities. And we need to make sure that that money uh, from the state, from government, goes directly into the pockets and bank accounts of disabled people and to let them make the decisions on what they need not defined by anybody else but by themselves that is the fundamental reform of the welfare system that is required and to me it goes hand in glove with this ascendancy of pride and with nothing about us without us etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, that is happening in the disability world it it we must disentangle the money in the welfare system that society thinks is going toward the best interest of disabled people, we must disentangle it from that and get it directly to disabled people. Uh, I, I know Deborah will have heard me bang the drum about economics for a, a long time now, but essentially no economy does well. Oh, sorry, I'm doing the Trump thing here. Uh, no economy <laughs> does well when we keep people in poverty. So by keeping people on low incomes, preventing them from earning and paying tax, we are actually reducing the GDP of the countries that we're living in. So, so absolutely, we need to flip the thing on its head. Yeah. And one of the ways we can do this too, um, and Deborah and I were talking about this um, on a on her other show, um, it's just actually to mobilize the purchasing power that exists already in the disability world. And I'm using the, the term disability world, but if you were to aggregate the purchasing power of people with disabilities, their families, their parents, brothers and sisters, extended family, their friends, their lovers, their spouses, service providers and professionals, if you were to aggregate that and then target that, um, I think we would awaken uh, government and the business and corporate world to the financial power of people with disabilities. So there's a couple of things involved here that I think are really significant. One is, of course, we must see changes in the policies uh, within our governments. But secondly, let's recognize that bold moves like that will not happen unless there is popular support. And I'm a community organizer, and popular support occurs when we organize ourselves. So for the disability world, I think that means thinking and acting like a movement. And so the many, many tributaries image I hear what we can do within the disability world to mobilize our economic power and make that a force that influences culture and popular media uh, portrayals of people with disabilities and then in turn encourages the bold political decision making that we need our politicians to make uh, on behalf of disabled people and what they're calling for now. So we've got a job to do too. And I think that's why I, you know, I really appreciate very deeply, uh, I'm not just saying this, what, uh, what you're doing, what you're both doing, uh, because what you're doing is spreading the world, the word, and saying to the world, let's figure out a way to unify our efforts within the disability movement and get allies outside of the disability movement, because it's all hands on deck. Oh, absolutely. So um, totally agree with you on the, the whole piece around the value of the collective community, as does Gartner, by the way, because they estimated that that market that you talked about was around $8 trillion worth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. Uh, and, and last week we had, we had uh, 
Rick from Freeney Williams on talking about the click away pound, so talking about motivating businesses by showing them that they're losing money. We've reached the end of our allotted time, I'm afraid, but it's been really, I know, I know, but we, we can carry on on Twitter. So, <laughs> That's right. So I'd just like to you know, put in a word and say thank you to the people that keep us going every week, our supporters, so Barclays Access, MicroLink, and MyClearText for keeping us going. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al.